Let's get started. Let me pray for us as we do. Lord, thanks for this time. I appreciate the fact that you are guiding us, that you are in charge, that you have woven a plan of salvation that we can trace through your word that you've given us. I pray for your insight tonight, that you would help us to interact with the text, uh, the book we're studying, but most importantly, Lord, that you would help us better interact with your word, that you would grow our faith and our surrender to Christ through the reading of your scripture. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So did anyone struggle with reading this chapter on the law? Oh no, it's great, that's amazing. First chapter that she read and she understood. I am so thankful to hear that. You know, I always worry every week after we leave, Lord, please let them not fail in trying. That's all I ask. <laughs> right, right. So I think this is a particularly difficult one for me as a pastor from, from a person who walks around with a pastor's heart because I have interacted with the church folk on all different aspects or takes on the Old Testament, right? And what should our take be on the Old Testament? I think our chapter kind of gives us a good approach to that. Uh, but I have, I have run into New Testament Christians who say, you know, I wish that, you know, I just really don't crack the Old Testament at all. I wish it weren't in there. I'd tear it out of my Bible if I could tear Bibles up, you know, because it's, it's that Old Testament angry God, and I much prefer the New Testament, you know, grace-filled, uh, forgiving God. And I, I want to say, are you paying attention to the pages of Scripture? You know, I, I just, I, I don't understand that mentality, and I want, if you came in here with maybe inheriting some of that, I want to break you of that this, this evening. I want to break that part of the belief system down with respect to the Old Testament and the law. And first of all, let me say that it is the same God who is in the pages of the Old Testament that we encounter in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Amen? Amen. That is the truth. And I, I wanted to read a quote from the first couple of paragraphs of our chapter tonight as a way to understand, I think it does a great job of talking about why God gave the law. So it says, uh, God is reconstituting them as the Israelites, them, as a people for his name at the foot of Mount Sinai. And we read about that in Exodus 19 through Numbers 10.10. 10. It is hard for us to even imagine the enormity of difficulty involved in this. And what we basically have as God unpacks the law through Moses on the steps of Mount Sinai, God taking a group of people who knew nothing but slavery, uh, they, weren't, they were um, third level citizens, they weren't first level, not second level, they were third level, they were, they were um, not even considered. In the, in the organization of the society of the Egyptians. They were sort of um, also rans. They were looked at on the level of not the garbage man, but the garbage truck, right? And this is their identity for hundreds of years. And in fact, when you see uh, Jacob move his people into Egypt, his family, from that point until you see Moses come on the scene is the longest period of silence we have in the scripture. Longer even than between Malachi and Matthew. Malachi, you know that Italian prophet? Yeah. Right? Okay. So this is a long time for a group of people to think about themselves in one direction. And it, it is a lack of group of identity. In fact, you might say that the Israelites identified themselves by what they were not, rather than what they were, okay? 
if ever there were a group of people that had been trained in victimization and uh, d increasingly difficult um, treatment by the powers that be, this is a story of, of the Israelites in Egypt. And so there's this story, this backstory of these people who don't have an identity, they're not really sure who they are, uh, maybe some tales of who God is is getting told around the, you know, the various uh, houses or hovels as people were trying to struggle for a living or uh, to keep themselves alive, I would say. And that's, that's the scene in which God enters and speaks to them through Moses and ultimately gets them out of Egypt. They see all these miraculous signs, but then he's faced with, how do I teach them who they are and how I see who they are, right? How does, how does God help the Israelites see themselves as God sees them? And so that's what we have when God begins to unpack uh, in, in Exodus 19 and following the law giving. That is this process of God showing the Israelites who they are, that they are worthy to know who God is, that they are they have value, and he wants them to know who he is and how they should interact with him. Think about that. The God of heaven, the creator God, is trying to help a group of people who see themselves as tertiary be beings, like throwaways, and he's coming to them and he's saying, you have value, you have worth, I want you to interact with me in a way that, that we can build relationship. That's what the law is doing. And for us, we're, we're coming at it from a, um, an aspect where we think that laws are simply do's and don'ts. Is, is there an aspect of the law that is do's and don'ts? Yes, right? That's, that's this word right here, apodictic. That's the fancy term for do's and don'ts, apodictic. I don't know if that's the way you knew that was said, but, and then, then you have these ca casuistic, rules that were, you, you, you know, there, there are two different kind of categories of rules or, or laws that, that the law breaks down into. And so how do we, as 2024 Christians, understand this set of laws that was given, well, 5,000 years ago? Is that, is that a safe number? If it was like 1800 BC, I guess that's a little bit of an overstatement. My wife's kind of over there going, no, it's not 5,000 years. It's actually 4,000 and something, or 3,000 and something, but it's a long time ago. What, how many of you remember 3,000 years ago? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. No, right? So how do we interact with this thing that's been given that long ago? And I think that's the hope of our author throughout the whole thing. And uh, Heather, I'm thankful that there was this understanding. It made sense, right? It just, it made sense. So, um, let's get into it a little bit. I think that God transitioning a people from slavery to a people of identity, if we keep that in mind, and that we, we remember, la does anybody remember what the key idea from last week is? It was the biggest thing written on the board. It was all about the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. Some people were like, wait a minute, I can't read the rest of the stuff on the board. Exactly. I wanted you to focus in on the one thing you could read, which was in blue, and it's in blue again. And if you think about this aspect of what is God doing with the Israelites, he's trying to help them get an identity because he needs to know what his character is like and what they're supposed to look like as a result of his character. The laws are all about revealing the character of God. Everybody say it. One, two, three, go. Character of God. Yes. It's not, if you went to Catholic school, you're just having a hard time with this right now because this is what you think about the law in the Old Testament. This is the way we think about the Old Testament law. My hand's red now because I've been slapping it so much. That's not what God has in mind for his people. We think of laws as ways for God to crush us. When in fact, the laws, and if you look at, I'll skip down to my last point, the do's and don'ts that he gives us on page 186 does a great job of, 
of giving us the complete idea of what the whole chapter is. It gives you the guidelines. It's, it's like a quick set of guardrails about the whole chapter. But God is trying to reveal to us his very character. And the, the guardrails of law, I want you to think of, of law as guardrails. They're, they're, they're there to keep people from wrecking their lives. God is willing to wreck your car so that he might save your life. Right? Because if you hit a guardrail with your car, ouch. But are you generally still alive? Yes. Why? Because it saved you from going over a cliff. Guardrails are put in place to do a little bit of damage to save you from catastrophe. And that, that's what God is doing when he gives us the law. He wants to give the Israelites uh, the law. And the reason why you and I want to read through the law is that we might understand the character of God. Did you catch some of that in the chapter this week? There's a lot of that in the chapter this week. When the, the little case studies that he does are excellent for that. And when he discusses um, the civil and ritual laws and when he's discussing um, uh, later in the chapter, where why would he give them these strange food laws? You know, these laws were given to, to protect the people. Not to make it so that he could slap them or grind them into the ground because he doesn't like them. It's because God loves them. His love is pouring out for them on the pages of the Old Testament. And it, yet for us to try and understand all of that, it's very confusing. Because there's all of these references in the Old Testament to the word law and even picked up in the New Testament. How many different ways? I think, it, does the author list like six different ways? You know, like that the law is used? Okay, so it's, it's the 600 plus laws. It's the, the word law is used singularly to refer to all 600 plus laws. You know, and then you've got the law meaning the Pentateuch, right? The Pentateuch is, is, is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So that the, the word law means the first five books, the, the five books of Moses. So there's one word, law, meaning five books uh, of the uh, Old Testament. And, and then you have the New Testament using the word law to refer to basically the Old Covenant, the rules and regulations and the way you behaved as a worshiper in the Old Covenant. Some, some writers in the New Testament are saying, you know, that was the law, meaning the whole Old Testament, you know, going and sacrificing and, and uh, having your sins not forgiven, but the scripture says it was, it was covered over, right? And that, that, what is that all about? And I love the, the part in the, the, the chapter where the author says, man, if we were trying to live according to the Old Testament laws, we would be arrested so fast. For animal cruelty you know I, I when I read that section it reminded me of when I was a little kid and my family was camping on the Mississippi River and there was this family that was camped next to us and we're all in our family we're having a great time all of a sudden we start hearing these squeals coming from the camp next, next to us. My mom is sitting there shaking her head. There's all these squeals, and then all of a sudden, this pig runs through our campsite with a knife stuck out of its neck or bleeding. I don't remember which. But they were over there, and they were, shall we say, euthanizing some animals that they might have them fresh around the campfire. And I'm thinking... This is crazy. And didn't the cops show up after that? And they were in trouble because of all of that. And I'm going, the author is absolutely right. I have experienced that. And as a little kid, I've been scarred. I don't, you can't tell anymore. I got rid of the twitch finally. <laughs> but if we were to try and do this, with all of these understandings of law, and it's really tricky for us, and how do we interact with it? One of the other uh, approaches that I've had when I was an interim pastor at a church in central Illinois, there was a, a, a several in the church where I was um, pastoring at the time, 
really, they thought that everyone should really follow Old Testament laws and teachings. And, you know, I um, didn't know it, but the reason they started telling me that is that I had chosen to preach through the book of Galatians, which is all about Paul saying that Jesus brings a new law. And he's, he's fulfilled the Old Testament law, and the Old Testament law has now been fulfilled. We no longer are held to that, which our author also talks about, right? As we, as we look at these laws, we have to understand one of the main ideas is that they're written for somebody else. And if we try to follow them, it's like we're saying it's Jesus and. Right? You know what I mean by that? If we have to follow the Old Testament, and they were arguing about this in the first century. You know, you read in the pages of Paul's writings and in the book of Acts. This Jesus and you have to follow. You have to be circumcised. They were arguing over this in the early church. But the problem is, is that we love to add law to our lives. We're just, we're, we like law. And we, we gravitate to it. Give me a digital choice, a yes or a no, an A or a B. A, the light switch is either on or it's off. We love stuff like that. We're not comfortable with gray areas. I think that's why we sort of fall victim to some of that. At the same time, is the law completely irrelevant as I'm talking to these, this couple and they're, they're upset at me because I'm actually quoting scripture and interpreting it based on the context that Paul was saying it to the Galatians, there was this difficulty that they had. And they said, it's, it's like you're saying that there is no value in the law. Is that true? There's no value in the law? No, so, so what do we do with that? How do we interact with that? Well, we look at the law and say this. Right here, what does that say? Because in the pages of the law, we see the character of God. We see him caring for a people. And I think some, in, in some ways, the Old Testament gives us such, so much fuller a picture of the character of God. Now, does Jesus act the same way as the Father in the Old Testament? Yes, he's displaying who the Father is as he's walking around in Palestine. He's showing us the character of God as he lives, right? But at the same time, if we place this weight back over us, as if we have to follow the law again, we're making the gospel out to be something that it's not, right? And so we want to understand law. We want to be able to um, understand when the, when the Old Testament is saying the word law, what law is it referring to? And that's why we have the, the discussion of the different ways the word law is used, right? And then even some more nitty-gritty detail is the second point there. We have civil laws and we have ritual laws. Do you see those there? Civil laws, penalties for various crimes, right? If you do this, this is your result. This is how you will be judged. It's... It goes into quite a bit of detail. Anybody ever read Leviticus and gotten excited by reading it? Not this guy. You know, how many different weird, wild scenarios do you have to run into in the book of Leviticus, right? But there's, there's a, a lot of detail in there because this is God helping a people understand how they're supposed to organize themselves. What does morality look like in your society if you're not given rules and guardrails and limitation? God is telling his people what his character is like and that his character is the guardrail by which you're going to organize your society. Okay? That's what the laws are showing the people and why there is so much detail. Now, these do's and don'ts and the apodictic laws, those, those types of laws, are they covering every possible scenario you can have? Does the law of the Old Testament cover every possible scenario? Is there ever been a set of laws that cover every possible scenario? 
This is the very discussion that we're having right now that Jesus had such a hard time with the Pharisees. Because they spent a lot of time trying to do just that. The Pharisees took those 600 plus laws and they added thousands of laws around that. It says don't do work on Sabbath. You're supposed to Shabbat on Shabbat. Do no work. So they had laws that were meticulous about that. Don't, you, you were, were not allowed to break blades of grass. If you walked across the grass, you weren't supposed to walk more, more than so many steps in one, you know, you're only supposed to take, I don't even remember exactly. It's like you're only supposed to take three steps and you have to take a rest because otherwise you're doing work. Don't walk across the grass because if you break a blade of grass, effectively you have just mowed the grass and you've done work. Remember the argument that Jesus had about straining a gnat but swallowing a camel? That's what he's pointing to. So the Pharisees thought, we need to have laws upon laws upon laws so that we never break the 600. So if we're way out here, we'll never break these. And they were missing it. How did they miss it? It wasn't about the letter of the law. It was about the spirit of the law. Which is why these civil laws and the ritual laws, they just give you guidelines on areas of life and how to deal with them. And God, God was going to help them by giving them brains to take one area of law and go, well, that kind of applies to this area. And as we see that in the Old Testament, guess what that does as we are New Testament Christians, as we look at civil laws and, and the do's and don'ts laws. Well, we look at those and we go, well, God didn't give them every little thing about what's a do and a don't. And so then we can apply that to our current day. And I'll give you an example. I was in a conversation with a student when I was in, in student ministry. I was a youth pastor and a student thought he had me. He walked up to me one evening at youth group and said, Pastor Tom, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking marijuana. So therefore, it must not be wrong. And I said, it doesn't say anything about hitting your mom in the head with a hammer and killing her either, does it? So that must not be wrong. He's like, uh, let me think about that. And I said, there's lots of things in there that it's not going to give you specifics on. But I can take you to several scriptures that talk about control and that God has control over your mind. And that he wants to be that space, nothing else. And I could take you to places where it says, don't get drunk with wine. You know why? Because first of all, the same idea. God wants to have control over your mind. The Holy Spirit wants to be guiding your mind. Not a spirit, lowercase s, but the capital S, spirit. And that God gave us brains to be able to take principles that are revealed in scripture and understand how they might apply in other places and that's what god does is he gives the israelites just enough to help them understand what his character is like and think that right there the character of god it's revealing god's very nature and character and that, that he cares about that that he wants you to know about that is why we have the old testament still and why he was so careful to take that original writings and, and make sure you had a copy of it. Because he wants you to know how, what he's like. You know why? Because he wants you to be like him. He loves you. He loved you enough to give you that. And the best thing that you can have out of your own children is that they're so proud of their daddy or mommy that they want to be just like him. And that's why God gave us the law. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be so proud of him and how much he's looking out for us and how he's caring for us that we want to be just like him. Why did he give him all those weird food laws? I thought that was an excellent point in the chapter because there's certain things that people in that area of the world are allergic to or are hard to make safe to eat. Pork is also one of those it's a little bit harder to make it safe to eat. You don't want medium rare pork. Don't do that. You'll have tapeworm. 
There, there was protection and provision for his people. The food laws were there to protect them and provide for them. And the weird laws, why no top two types of seed? Have you ever heard that? That was pagan worship. And he wanted them to be distinct from that and not to think that somehow that they could gain control over the known world by planting two kinds of seeds or mixing uh, donkeys and horses and getting mules, and somehow that that would give them more strength or more power or more guarantee of a harvest. God's saying, no, look to me, look to me, look to me. We can look at that and go, why, why not mix your garment types? We mix garment types all the time. When we mix garment types, it makes them better. They breathe better. They don't stay wet. They wick out you know, perspiration or they maintain heat better. Are we breaking some rule or, or uh, you know, approach to, that God doesn't want us to? Well, do you wear those thinking that you might control some bit of magic by wearing those garments? I don't think so. I see blank stares. <laughs> right? We're not doing that. And yet, as we look at that and we see it from a good exegetical place, we start to see that God is pulling them under his wings and protecting them like baby chicks. And he's spreading his, his protective wings over them in a way and giving them the, the way to live as a people that will bring success and will make them reflect him. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's basically a long and dark story of rejection of God as we read in the Old Testament. And for people that tell me that the Old Testament is an angry God, I'm looking at that going, wait a minute, how patient is God in the Old Testament? How much does he come back and say, no, come back to me. Just come back to me. Repent. Repent. We're going to talk more about that when we hit the prophets. Is that, is that what's next? I'm a little lost right now in the moment. I think it's next. We're talking about the prophets. <coughs> What a, I, that's, prophets are one of my favorites. And so as, as we move into that, give yourself time, because that's a bit of a longer chapter, if I remember right. I think it's like 23 pages or something like that. So. But in there is a God who is continually warning his people because he loves them and is asking them to come back to him. And so as, as we've read about the Old Testament law, this is God saying, look, Here's what it, like, it looks like to be a moral person. What it means to be acting good. I'm giving you what good means. You don't make it up for yourself. It's not like we read in the pages of the book of Judges where every man did as he saw fit in his own eyes. Where you're, each man is, is judging for himself. God's saying, no. Here is the standard. And at no point, did you notice this, no point does it ever say that following the worship of the Old Testament leads to salvation. Following the laws, it's telling you how to worship God from a heart that's already his. It's always a heart thing, even in the Old Testament. And that, that your sins are being covered over until Christ comes as the ultimate sacrifice the once-for-all sacrifice, the perfect lamb. At that point, on the cross, when Christ died, all the Old Testament sins for those who are passionate and loving and love God, their sins were forgiven on the cross as well. So it's, it's you know, Old Testament, come to the temple, sacrifice the lamb, pour the blood out. Your sins are covered over until Christ comes. You know, it's covering over. It is protecting you from it and causing you to, to be clean. Cleanse yourself of your sin. Repent of it. And then when Christ comes and he finishes the work, your sins will be wiped away as far as the east is from the west, which is an amazing thing because east never meets west. Eventually, 
you would tire out of going east because you can never finish going east. Right? Ever figure that out? When God says he move, removes your sins as far as the east is from the west, they never meet. They just keep going away from each other. If you're going north, eventually you start going south. But not the globe, because you can never stop going east and west. That means that God removes their sins from them completely. I really, I think that's what it's doing. At the cross. It is. So, as you head to your small group time, it is 7.03. I stole three minutes. So, give yourselves a half an hour. Be back here together, say 35. 7.35? See you then. Yep. All right. Ready? Break. Okay. We're going to get back started again. So, uh, questions, confusions, points to ponder. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any points of clarification or insights that you had that you want to share with the rest of the group or any of those kinds of things? I'd love to hear them. There was nothing. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, I was one of those people who thought, you know, wait, we don't need the Ten Commandments, you know, they don't apply. And when the New Covenant and this and that, and as I'm reading, reading the book, something said, you know, look, take another look at those Ten Commandments. And as I was reading them, all I saw was that if, if like I was telling these guys, if we applied just those things, yep. it would change the whole world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it would change Feel free to tell that to anybody you want to. <laughs> as loudly as you would like. Seriously. I fact, I stayed at work tonight when you go to work. Yeah. Even, even the, to the point that probably one of the most difficult of the Ten Commandments as a 20-plus year youth pastor that I had to deal with, with, with students who are trying to take seriously the Ten Commandments is, what if... What if my parent, what if my dad is, and maybe some colorful language was used, is an S, mm -hmm. son of a god, ah, she's a bad guy. So what if somebody that's my parent is a really jerky person and I'm called to honor my father and mother, you know? And even that, I think the scripture, it says honor, you know? I think, I think honor is a, is a function of position. Respect is a function of treatment. So honor is something that you have to hold the position of your parent is in your life. And there are certain things you have to deal with that. But respect is something, at least my father taught me that respect is earned through treatment. So don't misread what scripture says. You know, you, you're going you're gonna to run into that. It's like, the, because the reason I say that is because if your dad is somebody that does not garner respect, we tend to do that to God. We see God as, or put God, you know, uh, characteristics of our own parent, our own father generally, onto God. And if we can't learn to honor our fathers and our mothers, then we're going to struggle with keeping God in his rightful place because we'll, we'll if, if my dad was somebody that was always looking to catch me doing wrong and I felt like he was a perfectionist and expected that of me, we're going to see God, guess what, as a perfectionist. We're going to see him as somebody who's always trying to catch us when we're not doing something right. And the thing that will save us from that is if we're able to remember that God is in the position that he is in and that there's a certain amount of position that my my person has to have according to the position that God has in my life 
which is a person that I need to honor. There's, there's a certain amount of deference that I give him because of his position. But if he doesn't, ma- you know, if our earthly parents don't make good decisions, there's a boundary we have to put up there and not allow that because that's a different thing. But to dishonor our father and mother is something to, is to reject the place that they were given as our birth parents. Forgiveness comes in right at that place. Because if you don't, then you've got all the bitterness, the anger, the hatred, and everything, and then, we're, then we move to the other side. Yes, and it not it interesting that the world would have us make a distinction and be able to throw the baby out with the bathwater is that, you know, well, you're not my father. You're just somebody who made it possible for me to be living. I mean, there's all sorts of negative connotations to parenting in this world. And it's a throwaway concept now. You know, our society's trying to tell us that we don't need parents. We don't need a mom and dad. Isn't that interesting? It's taking that. For, for me, this is the way I can tell that the scriptures is onto something when, when the world tries to take that and turn it on its head. Flip it over. You know, we don't, we don't need men in our lives. Ladies are saying that now. And, and the family... We need to break them up. That's just a place where, where abuse happens and neglect and all of that. It's a divinely inspired unit that God gave. Now you had kids taking their parents to court for how they were treated. Right. So isn't it interesting? I, I agree with you, Ali. I mean, man, what a great, what a great group of of morals and it, that the that the world has problems with that <clears throat> tells you you're on to something good <laughs> yeah the so enemy, the enemy is working overtime the enemy is working overtime amen and we're trying we're the world is trying to tell us message that message over and over again so that you start to doubt wait a minute am i the one that's wrong here you know so if we focus on the fact that the law is showing us God's character, that will snap us back into reality, you know, and say, wait a minute, he's unpacking the right and wrong of the way life really is. That's the character of God being revealed. How important is it to know that? Because no, no other guardrails will apply because then they're just our suggestions. We need a set of morals that are outside of us. And God gives us that in his, in his Old Testament law. And you see it lived out in Jesus' life. And Hebrews does a really great job of talking about what the law did and how much Jesus did to fulfill it for us. And that we have a Savior who knows our, our failings and our hurts and our struggles. It's amazing. Wayne, you had your hand up. So as Christians, as we read the Old Testament, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just uh, uh, decimating the Palestinians. I mean, a, a group of people that I mean, Netanyahu was alive when when when, when the Holocaust happened in World War II. So, so what? So as, as Christians, what can our take on this whole deal be? That's for another class. I'm going to be doing next uh, <laughs> during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to deal with that one this summer. <laughs> yeah, I I think that that's a huge question to ask on what does it mean? What I hear you saying and the way I interpret it is what does it mean to think biblically about this? And I, I think that <laughs> that's too big to answer here, and I'm not trying to dodge it. Um, but if you'd like to talk about that offline, I would, if, you, if you've got a couple of hours. <laughs> So, Old Testament, should we should should Israel be in there now? Boy, yes and no. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with it. Um, yes and no, I think. But the Old Testament—that's what they did. You go back to right the beginning. Rip, got them all, came back, and I mean, to me, it's just history repeating itself. That's that's what they're not. That's what they're trying to feed us. They're after the enemy, and 
I, I would probably end my discussion with Wayne this way, and this is what I'm willing to say tonight. I'm willing to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. I, just, I just know that it would be better if Jesus were his, the fulfillment of his prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, would, would, is the only real answer for what your question is. And I don't, I just don't know other than that to say, where are, are you on your knees praying about that in a way, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And, and if there's something that we ought to be doing, Lord, show us as a church, what should we be doing in this? Because I, I struggle with it as well. I don't know that there is an ultimate answer that I could give you because I'm just, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not wise enough, I don't think. So... Everybody stop killing everybody. That's the humane solution, which ends with Jesus come quickly. Because then it's... Then it's well, is, is Israel actually slaughtering or is Israel standing up for being invaded? Yes and no. Still the same answer. So I, I would like to finish a, a little discussion on... Um, one of the benefits I sort of skipped over was the sacrificial law with the shedding of blood. I really thought it was excellent. Um, I would draw some, some connections between the last plague and the, you know, we, if you've been in church at all, you know about the blood on the door frame and over the top and on the side. And, and um, uh, Faith Baptist Church, when we were there in Grace Lake, our senior pastor was talking about this and he was a big PowerPoint guy and he showed these door frames with swatches of blood over the top and on the sides and then he had this cross sort of come in and superimpose over it, you know, and it's like this cross image that's there if you think about it, you know, over the door frame. And I don't know if you, you want to go that far in saying that, that it was um, directly saying this is what it's going to be like for Jesus, but it was foreshadowing of Jesus. I'll say that. And the shedding of blood, the whole sacrificial system, even from when Adam and Eve fall, uh, Pastor Dave alluded to this in, in his sermon that, that the Lord, the, the God and Father made us skins for them to cover them up. Well, he didn't just create those out of thin air. He, something had to die and, and the skins were made. And so from the very beginning, when there's sin, there's shedding of blood. And that is, a, that is a story that's woven through all of the Old Testament up into the cross when you have Jesus, the ultimate sacrificial lamb. And that was one of the benefits is that really God was preparing the Israelites to think about the fact that the Messiah was coming and was going to sacrifice himself. And there's, there's so, Isaiah's pretty clear that he's going to give up his life for the benefit of many and all of that. Yes. I was reading, I can't remember which one numbers or whatever it is, talking about the priests and, and the blood and how they would have to sacrifice and how they would get on their clothes. Yeah. And it occurred to me that Jesus, we always think of Jesus as a sacrifice, which is what he was. Yeah. The Son of God who was a sacrifice. But at that point, he also was like the priest because he had his, his own blood splattered on his own clothes. And so I, I just thought yeah. that when I read that, that yep. he, was, he was also our high priest. Yeah. And, and in that time when he was being beaten and all of that, yep. he, was, he was really both roles at the Amen. same time. King and priest. That's, Hebrews is telling us he was in the order of Melchizedek. Amen. King and priest. The other thing I thought, um, I really, the thing I took away from this was on 175, where it said Israel's problem in the Old Testament was not with their inability to keep the law. Right. It was with their choosing not to do so. Their, yeah. And, you know, that's what I read a lot when I'm reading in the Old Testament is just God's heart. I mean, yes, he's vengeful, but he's also heartbroken because you're, you're not listening to me, you're not choosing me, you're choosing other gods, you're choosing other people, you're going the other way, I've told you. Not to do this, yes. that, and the other, and you're 
doing all of yes. that. Yes. So it, it was a matter of choosing. It's yes. Usually when I read the laws, I just think, wow, thank, thankfully I don't have to do all this. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily even that. It was just that they chose not to do that. Yeah, they intentionalized not following God. Yes. Yes. And, I, you know, that's, that's the, when I was talking earlier about the dark slide down into rejection. That's exactly what you're talking about, that there was a de deliberate choosing to not follow. And God is continually so faithful. Even if you just read Judges, just sit down and read Judges one time. And, and it's like a sign curve. You'll, you'll see a sign curve where it's like they're, they're in the depths of despair. They cry out to God. God re raises up a judge and he rescues them. They're great. And then they fall down again. And then they get into the depths of despair. And then they cry out to God, and then they, he raises up a judge, and then they're up here. And it's like, Judges is a microcosm of the entire Old Testament. It's a sine curve, of a cycle of rejection of God, despair, calling out to God, deliverance. And, and, and then it's like, until Jesus comes, and then it's like this. <laughs> it just goes up and up and up. And the story just is being foreshadowed the entire time as it comes to Christ. And so it's just an amazing to read, the, to read the pages of the Old Testament and see God putting together this carefully crafted story of an anticipation for Jesus coming. And now we're in the time in between. We're waiting for him to return. So I, I want to talk about one thing that was in the, the, the chapter that I thought was really important that, and that was how much higher and a head and shoulders above any other law code that you find in the ancient Near East. Um, even, so society treated women poorly, the law doesn't. S society treats women poorly. Israelites treat women poorly, but the law doesn't. The law protects them. I thought that the, the, the book went into a little bit of this, you know, like with, with respect to servants and all that. And, it, you know, um, the history of slavery in our, cult, our country, it's sickening to think that there were so many people that tried to use Scripture to support that in a way that there's no way Scripture supports that. It, it rejects it. And it, it looks out for people who are economically, it's not, it's just not okay to mistreat them. They have to be looked after. And our, our chapter kind of went into that. And it is head and shoulders above everyone. There is no caste system in the law. The haves and the have-nots, everyone is supposed to be treated fairly. No matter what they have, if you treat them poorly, you have, you have to pay. There is some sort of payment. You're going, your own life sometimes. Um, I, I don't know if, if some of those laws, you know, as you think about it, and some of the do's and don'ts in the, in the apodictic, uh, that, that is, maybe we should bring some of those back for kids. Like if a child is disobedient, take them out. <laughs> you know, some of those are kind of like, oh, maybe... Maybe, but uh, who, who of us would have lived to adulthood then? <laughs> but I, I just want to say that there's the, there is an argument that's made in non-believing seg segments of our population that want to say, well, there are other law codes out there that predate, you know, the giving of the law by Moses to the Israelites, and. But there was a law that was given in Genesis that predates that. And our book goes into that a little bit. You have some law in Genesis. There's law given there. And some guardrails. But it's head and, head and shoulders above anything you're going to get anywhere else. You know? There was a three-tiered system with Hammurabi. Did you catch that? Yeah. You know, if you have a lot of money, you can do about anything you want. I don't agree with that. Do you? Anybody? You know, and there's none of that in, in the Old Testament law. 
And we need to be careful because some of these things, we find Jesus saying, we, we're, they're carried on into the New Testament. All ten of those commandments, all he's got it right. The reason that Jesus is very careful to kind of teach all of those is because, man, those are unchangeable. And that's God's character on display. And if, if society would just follow that, man, I just, I've thought that so many times. <coughs> if only. Tom, if, if you think, you know, Christ represents, is God, right? Yep. He's the one who carved the Ten Commandments in the stone with his finger and handed it to Moses. Yep. You know, all the other uh, ordinances and, uh, you know, uh, festivals and everything else, God said to Moses, tell the people this, but he didn't even give them scrolls or anything like that. Yeah. But the Ten Commandments, you know, he wrote very personally yep. Yep. into stone, yep. which kind of represents the permanence of it. And I've been to Washington, and they're carved into the walls in the Supreme Court building, too. Yep. In the King James Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 In the... And we, it, we want to speak the language Jesus spoke by speaking the King James. That's what I got in a little Bader Christian church. That's where that was. And the pastor said that to me, all right. That's a great sermon, Tom, but um, we should have preached out of the King James because you want to hear it in the language Jesus spoke. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, any other questions or, or thoughts? Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Sorry, Heather. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, did the Jewish people in Israel have, do they still do uh, animal sacrifices? Do they still, do the Jewish people still do animal sacrifices? No. No? Okay. No. At, after 70 AD, when Rome kind of came in and had all they had, could stand and couldn't stand no more yeah. from Israel, from the Jews, they, they, they wiped out the second temple. The Herodian temple that Herod built? Yeah. Not since. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, there's some who think that's a, like a fulfillment of prophecy that the temple will be reestablished and there'll be the, the sacrificial system uh, reestablished and that before Jesus can come back. I don't read it that way, but I understand why they say that. Oh, okay. But uh, that's just another way to point out that it's not happening now. Um, Yes, they still set, they do observe festivals, Yom Kippur and Yom, uh, yeah, the Day of Atonement. Um, they do, they do animal, I guess, butchering at separate places. I've flown several. Yeah, well, to make it, uh, to, if you're going to have a, kosher. to make it kosher, you have to take an animal's life in a certain way, not strangle it and all that. That's still observed if you're a Hasidic, if you're part of the Hasidim. You have to spit on your. Is you have to spit why, on your shirt if you say Jewish word, like Hebrew words, correctly. Is that why they 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 uh, the Hasidic is it the Hasidic Jews that, that pray at the wailing, wailing wall? Wailing wall, yeah. Is that for the rebuilt? It's the it's temple? it's because it's the temple and it's a place that's most holy and the and to be you know the Chesed just means righteousness, and it's the more righteous who are trying to follow more closely. Right the, the uh, Jewish uh, laws as best they can without the temple, which is really hard. Oh, okay. so, so yeah, that just means the more, the more um, I don't even know if conservative, but it's just the more rigid or biblical or they're trying to stay closer to what would be biblical Judaism. So yeah. And there's a real strong belief that at the temple, when you still have the foundation there on the wailing wall, there's, there's a place where God's going to hear you. It's totally missing the point that the curtain was torn and then everyone has availability to God no matter where they are, but I digress. Um, so is the wailing wall part of the temple? Yes. Oh, I didn't know yeah. Oh, okay. foundation. It's, it's part of the foundation, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually a mosque built over the temple now, along with a Christian church as well. Uh, yeah. So there, that happened after 70 AD when they basically the, the Romans came in and leveled it. And uh, some, some make the point that the mosque being placed on the temple mound is the, 
the object that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25 that's the desecration that's in the, you know, in the midst of the temple. But anyway, we're going to talk about Revelation later. That's all, I think we only have four chapters left. Isn't that wild? It's like we're in the back half of the book. Does it seem weird to have more of the book behind us than in front of us? Yeah, so next week, um, we are not meeting. That's Holy Week. And then we're meeting again in two weeks when we're going to take up the prophets. And we're going to talk about what prophecy is. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what prophecy is not. And um, just a little, a little bit more about this law thing and, and the covenant keeping that we're, we'll focus more on the covenant keeping aspect of the law and that week. And it's going to be good stuff. And you'll have plenty of time to read through it a couple times. So <laughs> let me close this in prayer and then we will be dismissed. Thank you, Father, that your message to us is consistent. It is always consistent. And when we perceive inconsistency, give us insight and understand, understanding as to what you're trying to say. Open our minds to understand the scripture. May we read the Old Testament with a new set of eyes that we can discover your very character on display. Thank you that you give us this time each week on Wednesday nights. Thank you for what a blessing it is in my life. Thank you that you give us each other here and that there is an esprit de corps and an openness to ask questions. Would you keep us doing that even after this class is done? Lord, that we would have minds that seek truth and want to know answers and, and fill in doubt with truth. Thank you for the, the word and how, how clearly it is given to us that we may wait well until you return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.